Very good. Well, thank you all for joining us this evening. It's such a pleasure uh, to have three friends and, and eminent commentators uh, joining us for this conf conversation tonight. Uh, we're going to be sitting down and talking about the Palestinian Gaza conflict, as so many commentators are at the moment, but not so much the substance or, or, or the details of the conflict itself, but really the way we are having that conversation, whether we are free to have that conversation uh, and, and, and ways other nations have set a different course. I think uh, overall, uh, I'm really pleased that in New Zealand, while an incredibly fraught, incredibly emotional conversation for many people on both sides, we have seen strong demonstrations on both sides of support, and those have been allowed. So, so from a government censorship perspective, that has been fairly light-handed, and, and we're pleased to see that. Notwithstanding, and we'll get into this a little bit, you know, arrests that uh, that we think are not acceptable, protesters that have been uh, taken away by police for disturbing the peace, and 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 other such vague accusations of wrong thing. This evening, though, we're, uh, we're joined by, as I said, three commentators that we specifically invited because they have enormous experience uh, and insight to contribute, but also a, a rare quality of, of being able to approach these questions from a purely principled perspective. I, I say purely, as, 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 as pure as humans can ever be, perhaps. So we have a uh, Professor Paul Moon, a, perhaps New Zealand's uh, most celebrated historian from Auckland University of Technology. Josie Bagami. Uh, Josie, perhaps New Zealand's most celebrated stuff columnist or, or uh, a, a, a famed stuff columnist at the FSU. And uh, Marcus Roberts, uh, the uh, a legal commentator, a legal academic. What's your exact role at the Maxim Institute, Marcus? Uh, yeah, I'm the director of research. Director of research. Maxim Wonderful. Yeah. So, so coming at this from three different perspectives, civil society, legal perspective, history, uh, media, I, I wanted to start with, can, can we go around and discuss how we are personally coming to this conversation? What, what perspectives we're bringing uh, to this debate? It is an incredibly fraught issue. I, I joked somewhat uh, before we were starting that that I didn't think that the trans debate would 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 ever paint something as you know that, that the trans debate is, is reasonable in comparison to the certainly with the the Palestinian Israeli issue uh it, it seems like automatically we attach ourselves to very emotive positions uh on such a fraught debate and and I don't want to condemn that at all that 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 censorship or or a tendency to try and shut down the other side that that we think has been harmful is a very human impulse and uh, I don't want to be holier than thou on in that regard but hopefully uh, as as we think through this conversation like others we're able to go but actually what's good for the goose is good for the gander if 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 free speech is this emancipatory rights it must be true first of all for my enemy and then for me so Marcus maybe we can start with you Kind of, what's your impression of the way we're having this conversation in New Zealand, and and how have you wrestled with that personally? Uh, yeah, so I think I'll start with the personal because I find that a bit bit easier. Um, the I started off um, coming at it from the, the the Blues Brothers standard, so I don't know if you remember that fantastic movie in the eighties where you have the Illinois Nazis winning their court case and being able to um, go out and protest, and uh, everyone's counter protesting, and the police are keeping them back, and the uh, Jake and Elwood. Um, run them off the bridge and they jump into the water. Um, so I was, from a very young age, I loved that movie. And so I had these sort of uh, uh, concerns about free speech. When when I saw this, I was like, oh, well, I'm, obviously that's terrible. The Nazis were allowed to, to to go. And then I was at law school and there was the uh, Valerie Morse case, the, the flag burning case on Anzac Day uh, in 2008. And again, I had real concerns uh, around that because I, you know, I didn't want our flag uh, desecrated. But I think just um, in the last uh, few years, as you see the real f difficulties of government um, uh, defining what f speech should or should not be um, uh, contained, that's when I started to say, oh, look, I'm, I'm moving more towards a, we have to be as light touch as possible. Um, so that's where, where I am. I've come from the Blues Brothers to uh, to a slightly different <laughs> view. Um, in terms of how New Zealand's going, yeah, I think I agree with your your opening start statement, Jonathan. I think the government response or the censorship has been um, been practically non-existent, which is good. I do worry about the, the, and I think this is not just this issue, but the depth of debate has been very shallow, I think, here, which is a, a problem. Um, but I'm sure we can discuss more on that. 
I'm, I'm afraid references to movies from the 1980s will uh, probably go over my head, but I assume that's uh, that's with regards to the Skokie case there, which of course is is a, is a famous um, and and a very principled defence of of the Free Speech Union. We had Nadine Strossen in New Zealand earlier this year, who had been president of the ACLU, and uh, and and we often appeal to that, and that that really is the rights. Uh, to speak for your enemies before anyone else, absolutely. Josie, how how are you going about processing this? Uh, I I think for, for those that are in the public, I will ask to constantly contribute in to the public conversation. This must be an especially difficult subject to to touch from from any direction. Yeah, I, I would say that the self censorship is quite high, and and I'm somebody who's you know been a, a advocate of free speech and free expression as part of the you know, enlightened universal values that defined in, in my youth defined the left. And, and somehow we seem to have shifted away from um, the universalism towards more tribal kind of identities, trump uh, the universal values of, of you know, human rights uh, uh, expression and, and so on. So, um, I mean, it's always been something that I've fought for and and it kind of perplexed me when when the left sort of didn't seem to make this a priority anymore um and and I found this you know more so where I I find that if I'm critiquing things that the left has decided are important or or, or untouchable that there'll be calls for me to you know shut up and I'm a Tory and uh you know cancel her so I'm very aware of that, and I think uh, this particular issue of trying to navigate where a, a, an issue you know, of, of two Indigenous peoples who have a right to a land, and the very emotive and raw and 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 suffering on both sides, and trying to to to, to debate this issue in a way that feels like you come to a solution ultimately, is really really hard. So I think, um, you know, the greatest uh, the, the greatest fear that most people have is not so much the legal uh, um, curbs of, of free speech, but the the social sanctions. The right. you know banishment is almost the worst possible thing you can imagine, right? And so, I think there is a greater well. Well, let put it this way: I think the tolerance of speech has been so weakened culturally if not legally, so it hasn't been weakened legally, um, but it has been weakened culturally that it's very hard to have these debates. And yet the the, and the final thing I'll say that I, I'm more and more aware of with the Israeli-Palestinian um, issue right now, that the angrier we get, the more important free speech is. And I think when I was young and naive and idealistic, I thought that free speech was about um, agreeing, uh, disagreeing agreeably, you know, sort of, uh, I, I protect your right to have a different view to me. What I realised with this issue is that the angrier we get, it's it's the alternative to hitting or killing each other. Exactly. And yep. so it suddenly it seems to me that Christ, wonderful Christopher Hitchens quote, the essential liberty, it is the essential liberty without which, I'm going to paraphrase it, but without which all the other freedoms you cannot imagine, let alone put into practice. And I understand that now. And and I think this is, if anything, the, the Israeli-Palestinian um, issue right now has brought that to a head. That might be a positive thing in terms of our ability to have these tough conversations. Mm. So much to unpack there. Uh, I I think you're right. We we haven't seen a terrible erosion of speech rights legally, but but not for want of attempts. Uh, there, there have been absolute moves to change our legal rights. Hate speech laws, of course, being one of them. Uh, that that thankfully, uh, you know, we we have been able to see down. But but even if we can defend it legally, unless we're investing at a cultural level, it, it's at a very human level. Uh, we're we're not going to have the ultimate cut through. And I can I can imagine the comments already that Nathan's having to deal with, as you say, comments like, "Well, uh, two indigenous people uh, constantly." Conflict and pain on both sides. Conflict and pain on both sides. Just acknowledging the most basic truisms, uh, the, the reality, the, the humanity of both sides. But it seems one side only advances at the expense of the other, that you can't acknowledge one side's pain or the other side's suffering. And and I think we're for a, poorer for it. So I, I hope for those that are watching even now as, as you're typing away on your t keyboard, as, as, as I fear some people might be in response to comments like that, 
the, the whole point of this is is that we're talking about humans on both sides and and there's right and there's wrong and and there's legality and there's all this that we could get into but but ultimately it's about saying what are the basic principles we're talking about here and Josie as you're concluding there without the freedom to think and the freedom to speak the rest of the freedoms aren't worth much and and that comes down uh, as the ultimate foundation of our human rights Jonathan, well, can you're... I just say one, sorry, I just, one more thing that to, off the back of that in case people are kind of, you know, commenting in, but um, the thing, one of the things that really got me was not the Blues Brothers film, but a TikTok, uh, and I'm sure many of you saw it, of this guy, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you, you young thing, um, but walking down uh, Queens in New York, and, and there was this one guy just tearing off the posters of the hostages, the Israeli hostages taken by Hamas. Um, and another guy was coming after. He was furious. He was angry. He wanted to punch the guy out. You know, stop doing that. We put those posters up. Stop that. And he's like, you can feel like, oh my god, he's going to hit him any minute now. And then he doesn't. And he says this thing where he says, you can wave your Palestinian flag and you can say death to the Jews or America or whatever you want, but I can put my damn posters up. And and there was it wasn't the legal um, um, uh, curbs of if I hit this guy I'm going to be arrested that stopped him it was the sense that I have to stand up for his rights to put to tear the posters down so that I have the right to put the posters up so in that moment and that TikTok video was the entire history of freedom of speech and the importance of it remarkable I mean uh, that man overcame many incredibly human impulses there and and i would say express this a far more civilized approach and hopefully that's what we are, are calling our entire society to paul i can only imagine that in an academic context at the moment um this is this is beyond fraught if it's fraught for the rest of us what it is in a university context is extreme uh is there any space do you feel for an open balanced inquisitive conversation to occur in, in, in your context? Well, I think there is. Um, it has to be handled appropriately. Um, my own experience with free speech started some time ago, um, before the fall of the Iron Curtain. I spent several months in Eastern Europe, and I saw firsthand what happens when the state suppresses speech and how very quickly that leads to citizens suppressing their own speech. Um, and there are, of course, people, I know, perhaps even people who are members of the free speech union who are free speech absolutists. They think you can say whatever you want to whomever you want in any way. I'm not one of those. Um, right. I think there has to be some limit, especially when it comes to the incitement of violence. And I think others may have something to say about that. Um, we have to realize that free speech is not an abstract conception. We can, we can talk about it theoretically and conceptually, but it's very much a, a thread in that whole fabric of society. And when you start trampling on that thread, you necessarily affect the fabric of society. And I think the other point too, is that I've never seen free speech as something worth fighting for, which might sound odd, um, because it's only a means to an end. And for me, the end has always been some approximation of the truth. So free speech is really just the vehicle to drive us to however we, we see the truth. So while it's got some very noble principles attached to it, they're not ends in themselves. They're just a means for us to discover the truth. And there's a, there's a long history, uh, particularly in theology, funny enough, um, dealing with that search for the truth and how speech is necessary precondition for it. That's right. A, a journey, not a destination in itself. Absolutely. Uh, have, have you had a personal experience in terms of how you're reckoning with the current iteration of the Israeli-Palestinian debate? I mean, I, I, I w without uh, straying into this too much, I, I felt myself the other day, I turned to my wife and I said, I feel my mind changing. And it, it, it was just a, a, a kind of a, a touching um, moment to go, I, I, I thought I thought this way. And, and because I'm listening, hopefully I'm trying to listen to these different people on, on one particular thing, I changed my view. Um, is, is the current iteration of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict kind of drawing you into any new reflections there, Paul? Probably not. I think the more I hear, the more I see, the more I, I realize that, um, it's a very difficult issue, obviously, and I think um, the argument perhaps tilts to one side more than the other. Yeah. Interesting. I, th I think that's the point, Jonathan, is that, that I, I would say when I was younger, I would have thought that the power of free speech is this ability to have civil discussions and respect the person that you disagree with. 
this is the point I think about the point the moment we're in now in history is that you realize you don't it's not about having to respect the person or or be convinced by them their argument or, or change your mind according to their argument it is actually fundamentally and this is the Fukuyama point it is fundamentally about a liberal alternative to violence and yeah. and you know in, in that sense Paul you're right it's a means to an end and that but it's a very important means to an end because the end is that we don't go out and have a hundred years war over religion, you know. And I think that this is the first moment that I have really grasped that very viscerally and physically that that's what it's about. Mm. Abs absolutely. I think um, uh, some of the viewers might be aware I, I grew up in Mozambique uh, in, the, in the 90s, shortly after the civil war there. So um, while not the Iron Curtain itself, uh, is, you know, part of the second world Soviet bloc. And uh, and as I came to New Zealand for university, it, it struck me how, um, well, frankly, how ignorant many people are to what has led us to the peace and stability and prosperity of our nation. And, and I I remember asking a lot of my fellow students and even some of my lecturers, was it by accident that you think we've mm. we've simply come on to this peaceful society that that has such a high quality of life and and social cohesion? It's not by accident. There are some fundamental laws that underpin it, and uh, and and certainly that that liberal in that traditional sense of the word. Again, that that word can carry many different weights but that liberal sense of coming out of the enlightenment of 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 some basic civil liberties of human rights the dignity of man uh that's really what it's been based on it is the alternative to violence absolutely and so so in in that vein paul you you called out explicitly the fact that and and i i couldn't agree with you more uh that free speech does not protect incitement to violence and i, I always stress that's not because incitement to violence is one bridge too far we go we go so far along a horror horrible list but then won't do that last bit of incitement of violence that's not the case at all it's it's because incitement of violence is as you're saying Josie the antithesis of trying to persuade and use reason and dialogue to um, to elicit peace not force so I, I'll reference the legal standard uh, one that I don't think is satisfactory perhaps to some here or certainly to some of our listeners as the free speech union has talked about this in our correspondence we know that many of us supporters do not agree with where we've come to stand and, and we accept that but this is the international jurisprudence as it were and, uh, and and we'll see how satisfactory it is to you so the Brandenburg test that came out of the the um, Supreme Court in the United States says that effectively there are three tests to what incitement to violence are. Uh, physical violence, those words, those ideas hurt me, doesn't cut it. You have to really be inciting physical harm to someone. Uh, imminence, they have to be kind of broadly about to do it, not kind of conceptually or generally uh, inciting it. And thirdly, and this is one where a lot of people have disagreement, they have to have capacity to carry out the threat that they are inciting. This would mean the horrible, and I have no problem saying that, the absolutely condemnable, odious scenes that we saw in Sydney of a crowd chanting, or oh, I should say portions of a crowd chanting, gas the Jews. That to me is among the most condemnable of ideas. Uh, I, ideas that we, we must organize against and, and we must oppose. But ideas which I don't think should be prohibited by law it doesn't meet all three tests of the brandenburg case and i think if we looked into it despite the incredibly visceral response that we may feel uh suppressing those ideas stands to do more harm than good it's not a case where someone is literally about to be gassed because of those ideas and so with that in mind we are better to use counter speech and know who what i would call the barbarous are in our midst rather than trying to use the government forces to suppress them paul my suspicion is you may disagree with me on that or, or perhaps not I, I, what are your thoughts with regards to the brandenburg test and the way we apply them specifically in in, in this situation well i do disagree with you on two points um the first point is if if you have a number of people publicly saying gas jews you're quite right in the sense that no one's going to suddenly do that. But what you're doing is you're creating an atmosphere where that sentiment, that sentiment of genocide is suddenly acceptable. It lowers the moral bar. 
And that quite conceivably, and we see this throughout history, when that moral bar is lowered, and Germany in the 30s is the, the case study for this, terrible things happen as a consequence. It may not be immediate, but they happen nonetheless. So we have to be very cautious when we hear that sort of thing being said. The other thing too is I'd, I'd, I'd argue, and this is where I perhaps disagree with you, is is that we need to look closer to home, to what our own law says in terms of inciting violence in the Human Rights Act. And if you're inciting hostility or ill will, I think those are the terms that are used, and that's an offence. And we've, we've seen comments made in New Zealand to that, to that extent. Now, you might say, well, look, sticks and stones and so on, but these are just words. But they, they're words that contribute to, to a climate that leads on to, for example, people having their houses vandalised, people um, being pushed and shoved because of their, their ethnicity. And this is happening in, in New Zealand right now to the Jewish community. So um, the, the moral bar is being lowered. There's not a direct cause consequence that you can cite and say, well, this incited this thing, but it certainly is having an impact. And what stops that? Very interesting uh, and 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 good. I was really hoping we wouldn't all agree here tonight. So so thank you, Paul. We'll we'll tease this out. Um, my, my, my I guess two initial responses, and then Marcus and Jody, uh, Josie, I'd love to hear from you guys as well. But uh, in terms of lowering the moral bar, I mean, it's not like the moral bar. The only moral bar is to not kill someone or not to physically uh, assault someone. The moral bar exists in many, many contexts. Not not reducing someone's dignity, pro probably not even intentionally insulting someone, is a moral bar. But certainly, no bar I would want to see the government protect. And so when we talk about lowering the moral bar, of course, the reason I'm a free speech advocate is not, I would never say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Words have incredible power. It's the only reason I fight for them to be free. And, and, and I agree, every word we utter will contribute to society positively or negatively or quite often both. But do we want the governments to be the party deciding when and where that can be expressed? I, I, I would also say that you, you're appealing to the, the legal standard here in New Zealand, which is stupid law. It, it may be the law here, and they may have uh, been unsuccessful in changing it, but the Free Speech Union would still call it stupid law to say that you can't bring someone in, into contempt. It's not the government's role to decide who we hold to contempt in society. And and so I would say I would very I would have a lot of caution in, in appealing to the current hate speech laws that we have because I find them quite flimsy myself. Marcus, uh, you, you're legally trained. What's your comment there? Yeah, so I mean I think the incitement part of the Crimes Act it's very hard to to prove. You have to show that there's been a, an actual offence that you incited or you threatened to kill someone. So you can threaten to kill or harm a specific person and that's an offence, or someone has gone out and committed. Uh, uh, an offence has attacked someone and you incited them to do it. And then then you get into questions around, you know, your intention and, and how specific was your um, your incitement. Were you talking about this particular person? Were you talking about a group more generally? How close were you to the offence, et cetera? Um, I think that that Human Rights Act one is, is perhaps more uh, applicable. That would be the, the, the way you'd go if you had something like what happened in Sydney and New Zealand. Um, and what I, just a couple of points I'd make on that. The first one is, uh, it's not just about race or race or ethnicity. It's also about national origin, um, which I think might be relevant or potentially relevant in debates where we talk about, you know, um, not anti-Semitic but anti-Zionist. I mean, well, na nations are also potentially part of of that, although it's not clear. Um, the second part is, of course, that you can't get a pro you you need the Attorney General to to agree to a prosecution under that, um, which I have. I mean, that's a, a separate part of that law, which I have real problems with, that, that we shouldn't be relying, that, that having that specificity of who's the attorney general, what side of the bed do they get up with this morning, what do they think about freedom of speech, that is far too inconsistent, goes against principles of, of general law and treating like cases alike. Um, so yeah, so I just I just say that, look, the Brandenburg test, I think, is, is interesting. I don't think it's... Um, uh, in New Zealand, it's 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 much harder to get incitement um, apart from under Section 131 of the Human Rights Act, which I think is is, is problematic for the, the reasons you've said. Just before we draw you in there, Josie, Marcus, can I just ask you to confirm that again? Because the accusation that the Free Speech Union consistently faced across our campaign against hate speech law was that someone could go around saying, kill the insert whatever group you want, and they could get away with it. And we said, nonsense, it is already illegal to incite direct violence against someone, isn't it? 
Yeah, so everyone is liable to imprisonment for a term not exceeding seven years who threatens to kill or do, do grievous bodily harm to any person. So that's in the Crimes Act already. Yeah. Josie, uh, what's your mm. take on this? Yeah, I mean, I think this is the problem when you think about free speech as the ability to have a reasonable debate and to respect each other's views and, you know, persuade. Because, as Paul says, there's no... that. I've got no desire to persuade somebody standing in Sydney shouting, gas the Jews. Um, so I think you have to start from a point of, the point you have to start from is what what do you do about hate speech that's effective? And I'm very influenced, as I know you guys are too, with Nadine Strossen, who spent her life um, uh, researching this, you know, because, because she says, I love free speech. Um, or, or rather, you know, I, 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 you know, she's Jewish, and she feels, you know, that she loves her Jewishness more than she loves free speech. So, if she felt that um, it was an effective thing to do to ban hate speech against Jewish people, she would support banning it. <laughs> but her her research has showed it's it's the least effective thing you can do. And um, so, I think you have to start from there. And she uses this great example. Um, which I know we've discussed before, that in 1930s Germany, where you know there were hate speech laws, the the Weimar Republic banned Mein Kampf, uh, you know Nazis were chucked in prison for their hate speech. There were hate speech laws. Um, there were students from Germany who who were exiled, went to America, tried to get Mein Kampf published, uh, so that you could warn that they could warn the world that this was coming, and they couldn't because there were hate speech laws. So if you you know you've got to look at the consequences of actually banning stuff, burying it, putting it underground, um, and whether that's effective. And and the thing that, you know, when I listen to someone like Nadine Strossen, the thing that she said was most effective, she uses this example in Germany, modern day Germany, 2017, where there was, you know, the Nazis would, would have a march, you, you know, neo-Nazis march every year. Um, and she said that the response to it from the community was rather than campaign to ban it, was to turn it into a sponsored march, <laughs> you know, 10 euros for every, um, you know, so many metres marched, and they would raise money to put towards fighting extremism. So they ridiculed and diminished what could have been, uh, if you tried to ban the neo-Nazis, could have turned them into martyrs, could have, as they did in Weimar, Germany in, in the in the 1930s, in which case you would have actually given, a, given far more muscle and teeth to these abhorrent ideas. So I think you have to start from a point of what is the effective thing to do about hate speech? And, and banning it just simply isn't an effective way of dealing with the hate. You've got to deal with the hate, not the speech. And, and that's right. Largely, uh, I agree, Josie. I was very taken by uh, Nadine's commentary there. And I think it showed that very few people in this debate are ideologues, are, are really committed to an idea simply because of the idea. We're committed to the idea because we believe it's effective. And I think she said, I, I love free speech, but I hate racism more than I love free speech. Yes, and that was a, that's a better um, yeah, <laughs> account of if, her quote. If, yeah. if I could do away with racism by doing away with free speech, she would. And, and, mm. uh, and, and you know, I, I'm not a Jew. I don't have that same uh, ethnic or national connection to the issue. But, but there are other things that if I could do away with them by doing away with free speech, I would. And yet... Uh, they're but much what, deeper than that often. She said, uh, and she also says very clearly, you know, threats to life, threats to, to physical violence are not protected. Yeah. Harassment isn't protected speech. Defamation isn't protected speech. And ironically, modern day Germany has only just recently had defamation laws um, or, or anti-discriminatory laws, rather. Um, and they, you know, they've still had hate speech since the 30s, but they haven't had anti-discrimination anti -discrimination laws, um, which are more effective that, uh, in dealing with the impact of hate speech, which we all agree, you know, the, the idea that word, sticks and stones will hurt my bones, that words don't hurt me. So, um, you know, and, discrimination and I think, is an action. Yeah. And Paul's point about your point, Paul, about, um, you know, I mean, gas the Jews as a statement is 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 on on the edge of uh, an exa another example would be, um, you know, burning a, a cross on the lawn of, of an African-American person in America. You know, that would be prohibited. That, that's 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 a direct threat. So I would say that chanting something you know hideous like that in Sydney is right on the edge 
of being banned speech, but it doesn't quite fit the criteria. Whereas, yeah, a swash sticker on a Jewish synagogue, that's that's at the, at the, at the very least vandalism, if not um, threat. And uh, the same with burning a cross on the lawn uh, of an African-American family and person in America. So yeah. these things need to be debated, but there are, I think there are clear differences between protected and unprotected speech. And, and I hope I don't give the impression, and, and, and I'm sure we'd, we'd all share this, that uh, no matter which side of these issues we come on, uh, Paul, I, I know, uh, despite the disagreement that we have here, that you are a, a, a laudable defender of free speech and champion of free speech. So it's it's not that, like, we've, we've landed on one side or the other and, and are ignorant to the claims of the other side. Uh, again, I, I can't condemn in the strongest terms uh, the, just how horrific the claim is there. Uh, and, and our team, you know, when, whenever I say this, we end up getting correspondence going, I'm not sure the Free Speech Union spends hours debating anything, but that's not true. Our free... Our, our team has spent hours debating this issue. And the reason I, I started with kind of the very personal, emotional response of, of how have we ended up where we are on this issue, because uh, we, we sat around thinking about these questions and we'll get into some of them, like why should protesters be allowed to burn Israeli or Palestinian flags? But, but we kind of knew the arguments there. We went, but how are people engaging with these conversations? How are people wrestling with it internally? And I think that's the far more interesting story. We, we have reached out to uh, to Germany as an example here. There is the claim that that once we reference Nazi Germany, the argument is lost, no matter what <laughs> it is. But but um, re referring to Germany, nonetheless, in the modern era, uh, both Germany and France, again, not least because of the incredible history of anti-Semitism that they've had, have enacted incredibly stringent laws around since October 7 around pro-Palestinian protests. And uh, the, the, there are always questions around what is pro-Palestinian and what is pro-Hamas, but but even just what, what is indisputably just pro-Palestinian has been prohibited uh, by the Minister of Interior in France and, and by other laws in Germany. I think I think in Germany in parts they they cancelled all demonstrations in order to ensure that anti-Semitism would not emerge. And, and some commentators would look at that and go, the, the, the national guilt that Germany is uh, famed to have borne now produces new forms of oppression by silencing those who have a, a right and some might say a duty to speak out here. Uh, Marcus, you, you you said that you looked at New Zealand's uh, legal position and, and you said that the way we've landed has, has roughly been correct. Do you think there's more to it than just the experience of the Second World War that has led Germany and France uh, to enact these prohibitions? Are we are we at a different state in our uh, conversation around free speech that has led us to these different positions? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it is. I think you can't go past what happened in World War Two throughout Europe um, as as a big answer, a big uh, answer to the different approaches. Um, but also, um, I think there's just a, a wider historical divergence there. They don't have the um, Anglo common law tradition that we do, which has um, been very different from the continental position around the uh, interaction between the state and the individual. Um, that that the the freedoms. We've, we've talked about before that the freedoms we enjoy today they haven't come out of nowhere there's a history of centuries long struggle um within england and then throughout the commonwealth and america around this that, that is different i think to what's happened elsewhere uh in the world including continental europe around free speech i just think that culturally and legally they're in a different place and are far more um i think uh happy to have the state crack down quite heavy-handedly um in that manner um i just think there's also you know there's there's a more recent history as well there's a whole lot of um islamicist terrorist attacks that they've had to deal with in the last 15 years or so they've got much larger um muslim and jewish populations within their um countries that we don't uh, as a proportion which i think is also impacting on it so I just think there's a whole whole host of different reasons why we'd come at a different um, legal position than they have. Um, yeah, so that, that's why whether it's good or not, I think, is a different different answer, a different question. But and, and is is there a defence to be made for the way that they respond to this? I, I'd open that up to any of the three yeah. of you. Certainly, from our perspective, there is no defence in in prohibiting the right to protest in favour of a national and a political cause, whether that is 
uh, pro-Israeli or, or pro-Palestinian. It's a different question when it becomes explicitly pro-Hamas. But then we would say only if it's inciting violence. That that mm. if, if if someone is wanting to celebrate the attack of a terrorist, what does it achieve for us to silence them? Wouldn't we want to know? We, we've talked about the moral bar. The moral bar at that point is sunk quite low. Wouldn't we want to know who those people are and engage and organize more effectively to counter that? Again, I think uh, many people, when I say you should be allowed to express support for a terrorist group without providing any material support for that group, uh, they think it, it, I, I undermine the power of certain Islamic terrorist groups, not in the slightest. But why wouldn't we want to know who these people are, not least for national security purposes here in New Zealand? Uh, Paul, do you, do you have a thought on that? Well, I'm going to disagree with you again. Um, Wonderful. I think in, in, in the case of Germany, for example, um, there may not be a justification for their suppression of free speech, but there's certainly an explanation. In 1945, at the end of the war, when Germany had to confront what it had carried out, genocide um, it put a lid on that evil and it's tried ever since to keep that lid on and any possible hint that the lid may move and that evil may surface again is something that I think German policymakers and lawmakers just cannot contend with and for that reason they tend to lurch in all sorts of odd directions to suppress speech because they're so fearful of that and that's perfectly understandable I'd be quite anxious if they weren't I'd be quite anxious if the German authorities said, well, look, that's in the past. We've changed. There's no risk anymore. There's always the risk. Anti-Semitism has been with us for thousands of years, and we've seen that the worst of its manifestations in the 1930s and 40s. So Germany uh, may not be doing the right thing from a, a purist free speech point of view, but we've got to be aware that's where the Holocaust started. Yeah, that, that, I think... That, that's uh, so, sorry, Josie. One, one, one second, just on Paul's comment there. Paul, that, that's a little bit of a of a backhanded there in a, in a purist free speech sense. Uh, are, are they do, so? They may not be doing the right thing in a purist free speech sense. I accept that. Are they doing that uh, the right thing though? In, in in the attempt to keep the Jewish population safe, if that is their attempt, is this not actually counterproductive? No, it's not counterproductive at all because one of the ways of looking at free speech is to to pick examples and say, well, look, the German authorities are doing this now. They're banning pro-Palestinian marches. That's terrible. That's that's uh, an insult to free speech. And we can look at these snapshots, but um, what historians tend to do is, is look at the longer term. We see trends. And so when you have people shouting anti-Jewish slogans in the streets, you might think, well, that's just free speech. But if you look at the trends, that heads in a very bad direction. And but the problem we can't oh, stop sorry, it by yeah. so I was gonna say, we can't stop it at that point. We can't stop it at when it's got to the point where people are having um stars of David put on their clothes and they're being sent to death camps. That's far too late. It has to be nipped in the bud much earlier. So that sounds to me, Paul, like an argument um against free speech. Uh, in 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 the case where the words are offensive and are deeply offensive and um, uh, uh, you know obnoxious and hideous, right? So the problem with that again, I start from the position of the question isn't should they be allowed to say this, but what do you do about that hate and is the effective thing um, of that hate speech to ban it? And if 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 we you know. I mean, if you believe in the principle of free speech, then you've got to be able to affirm it in the toughest of cases where there are competing values as well, <laughs> where it's really, really hard to stand up for free speech. Um, and, I and you know, I, I come back to the, if, the argument that if you don't stand up for the principle of it, you just look back in history again where, um, you know, white slave white slave owners have used the same arguments that black lives matter used now to ban speech they have right. you know they have said that the abolitionists who wanted to ban slavery were hateful and they were hateful towards white people and southerners and that it was damaging and emotionally they actually used these words and they actually enacted you know they, they introduced legislation hate speech legislation so if if you're if you can't defend the principles in the toughest of cases with competing values, i.e., you know, the, the offence that people feel, then what is to stop um, in a time where your your enemy will use the same arguments that you've used to be able to do what they want to do? So again, I, I, I and say what they want to say. So I, I come to the point that if if 
where issues are unsettled and where we're really, really angry on both sides, and I, I include the trans issue with this, Jonathan, too, and you look at Israel and, and the Palestinian issue, these are unsettled issues because we're finding it hard to work out what is the just path here and how do we how do we juggle competing um, um, calls for justice. These are unsettled, even more important, important that we keep debating them. And the, the point about free speech is not that, you know, someone will have a civil argument that I can civilly disagree with. It's that in order to deal with these really angry moments in history, people will be angry and unpleasant and obnoxious and offensive, and they'll border on hitting and violence and, and worse. And somehow the most effective way of dealing with that has to be discussed rather than should it be banned sometimes yes but there, there are a lot of examples that most examples in history where you where you see aggression by one group against another you, you'll be very very hard pressed to find a single case where that aggression spontaneously occurred there are a whole lot of precursors to it and a certain sort of speech is one of those precursors this is why we have to be careful some people talk about chopping the heads of jews off or people talk about which has happened in new zealand in public or people talk about uh, gassing Jews or killing them or ethnically cleansing them, um, mm. these sorts of things. These are precursor statements to something much worse. And then we've seen this in the last two months, the escalation of, of vandalism and um, assaults against people who are Jewish in New Zealand. It didn't spontaneously erupt. It has these precursors. And so while the principle is important, we've got to always weigh that principle against the, the risk of harm. And we're seeing that harm already. And, and I would say that that yeah, I would say those examples you just used there, which is why the Sydney example too. I, I you know, I'm on the edge of agreeing with you on that because I think those are threats to violence. If someone's walking down the street saying chop someone's head off, um, you, you arrest the bugger. You know, I, I, I'm not. I think that that's you know those are examples where, um, you know, that we are getting into a grey area, right? Can we can we play that through though? Because uh, and and far be it from me, Paul. Not only for the personal affection that I hold you with, but but the the uh, quality of your historical qualifications. Uh, I'm not going to try and challenge your analysis of history, but it does seem to me that this narrative that in 1930s Germany it was a free speech absolutist environment where Hitler could say anything, anytime, anywhere, and because of that, the Third Reich came to power. It, it, there, there were many limitations on his speech, and I would say they, if anything, breeded an environment, a context of disdain for power that actually led him in his fascistic tendencies to power. So let's play this through a little bit, Josie, with what you're saying around mm. if someone's saying chop someone's head off, um, arrest the bugger. Look, if they say, I, I, I totally agree. If, if if it is a direct incitement to violence. Put them away. Why? Because what happens very shortly after that otherwise is the opposite of free speech. It's violence. But if we play it through, gas the Jews. Sydney police go in there. They they arrest the people that they could directly see with amplified voices chanting that. What does that do to public conversation? What does well, that do to, to the debates around Israel-Palestinian conflict? Now, is it a condemnable idea? I can't stress it enough. It absolutely is. But don't we want to know who those people are? Are they not more dangerous being made martyrs? I, I, I would come from the point of view that is it even effective? Because if you look at even recent times in, uh, well, just in Australia, they've banned the, the Nazi salute or they've banned, no, they've banned the, the swastika and the Nazi salute or, or, or Nazi insignia. You know, they've made some dis distinction between, I don't know what, you know, does it mean like the SAS uniforms and, and a moustache? I'm not sure. But um, the problem with that. Is that you go well? Of course, it's it's, it's hideous, and and I don't want to see people walking down the streets with Nazi salutes and swash stickers. But um, the the problem with that is that you've got the same people. You'll drive people from the fringes who are angry about something else, who think, well, I'm going to join these guys. Um, and and also, what will happen in that Nazi group is that they'll find they find other symbols. So they do the OK symbol, or they do you know the three finger symbol, or they find another way of signalling these obnoxious views. So are you going to ban the ban the okay symbol and then you have to also ask the question if you're going to ban um uh you know a nazi salute or a swash sticker in the streets you know are we then going to ban isis and any isis symbolism because it's an equally obnoxious ideology that wishes to see um uh you know people who are if you're not islamic a, a, 
the right Islamists, Islamists, you should be killed or, um, uh, you know, so where do you, where does that, where does that principle take you? And does it, and has it at the end of the day done anything to prevent the hatred and the and those obnoxious views, or has it amplified it? Has it given it more publicity? Has it allowed more people to join by making an issue of banning um, a piece of symbolism, uh, which is obnoxious, but does banning it make it go away? I, I, I broadly agree with you, Josie, but I would say the one thing that laws can do around that is that you are setting a marker in the in the sand that this is this is something that the society does not accept. Uh, the trouble I think we have is that we are hard pressed to come to any st concrete statements about what society doesn't accept because of our inability, I think, to to agree on those. So I think there is some benefit to those sorts of laws in that sense. But I, I do agree mm. generally they are um, being seen to try and do something about these abhorrent views um, without really addressing the underlying um, the issues that why people hold them um so but i think there is a there is a signifier with law that's saying that you know actually generally mm. society doesn't accept these and and that's probably the only benefit i see from them because if you were going to ban one thing would you not if you were to ban that you know um yep. obnoxious nazi insignia mm. you could make an argument that you're going to ban anyone as some as countries have that you're going to ban anyone saying from the river to the sea because what that in what that in effect means is the um complete annihilation of the state of Israel and Jewish people in Israel. Yeah. So you, if you're going to yeah, ban definitely. one thing, you're going to have to accept the argument to ban the other thing. And then we're banning an awful lot. Well, I wouldn't, Paul, I wouldn't, can we draw you in here? Well, I'll just, just make one point about that. Um, if we're going to have a society that cherishes free speech, there's a corresponding obligation that that free speech has to be informative. And when you talk about gassing the Jews, no one can convince any of us that there's any value in that statement whatsoever. It's just an, a, a statement that espouses genocide. And that's spitting in the face of all those people who hold free speech to be important, because what it's saying is, you've given us license to have free speech. We will now abuse that and have the lowest common denominator speech you can possibly imagine. And so that detracts really, from the quality of the discussion. That's really interesting, Paul, because I don't think that is the free speech argument, that it should be informative. I think the free speech argument and that's uh, has become more and more apparent to me with the with the Israel Palestine issue Hamas where it's about what do you what do you do to stop the violence and 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 how do you manage a, a society where you've got very angry very very angry people who are very raw about these issues how do you manage that 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 anger. So I don't think you can say that the definition for free speech should be that it should be informative. Otherwise, it's not no. allowed. And, yeah. and, I, yeah. I didn't, yeah, I, and you're right. I mean, I didn't say that that should be the definition of it, but there is a correlation. There's an obligation that comes with it. And I understand that people are very angry about this issue, but you don't resolve the anger by encouraging a whole group to be killed. And not only killed, but drawing on the Holocaust, yeah. which is one of the seminal yeah, moments in human history. Image. Yes, in, in order to buttress your argument, that's horrific. And that, as I say, is basically denting the quality of free speech. And it's not informative. No one's better off. No one's more informed. No one's got a different perspective because people go around saying gassing the Jews. It's just a... But, that, but that's not what, the, exactly. that's not what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. there's, two, do. there's two arms yeah. to it, right? And you're saying, Paul, that n none of us are better off for that. And you're absolutely right. But is... Is it possible for us to pursue a response that makes us worse off? And I think, Josie, that's what I hear you more saying. Not that Gas the Jews contributes anything to a discussion, but that censoring that could actually make the very people that are intended to be protected by it, in this case, the Jews, worse off. And I think but that's, that's not the... been the case in history, though. The, the, the case in history has been the opposite, that if you have a group of people chanting slogans about killing others and they're given free reign to do so, in a lot of cases, I, I, they, they I, move I, on and do that. No, is I, that I the history, though? Uh, yeah, because if you, if I mean, as uh, your point, Jonathan, about 1930s Germany, and we keep going back to 1930s Germany, but even looking at today's Germany, where they've had hate speech laws since the 1930s, they did, they did ban it. They did, they chucked people in prison for for saying obnoxious, nasty, um, uh, you know, um, genocidal uh, Nazi slogans, and it also, didn't work. 
I was going to appeal to um, uh, more recent incidences, though, where you look at a, a series, not least of all in New Zealand, perhaps here in Christchurch, and I don't want to stray too far beyond my expertise, but it would seem to me that there have been a series of attacks, again, in, in uh, Norway as well, where individuals didn't feel like they could express certain, in my opinion, condemnable ideas. And because of that, they did feel like they had to take more extreme forms of violence. And and, and so I, I don't know, I, I would say a historical analysis probably can point that that censorship can have a very bloody cost as well. I, I, I'm, I'm so glad for the, for the robustness of this conversation. I, I'll let you in on a secret. I didn't, I expected there to be a disagreement. I didn't expect the personalities who are taking certain lines to be taking the lines that they are. So we, uh, all, we're all the better for it. I'm very pleased with this. I have a whole list of questions and, and we've got 10 minutes left and we've only just started. So perhaps we'll have to run over. Paul, can I draw you in on the subject? Uh, uh, Josie mentioned from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. We, where we started in this conversation this evening was talking about incitement to violence, why that is antithetical to the value of free speech and, and some of the technical or non-technical definitions of that. We've stepped that back to gas the Jews and, and, and disagreed over the contours there. Let's take a step back further. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free features in one of the Hamas constitutions and has existed as a chant much uh, more beyond that uh, a as a general slogan of Palestinian liberation. So when someone chants that, th there are some who could be quoting directly Hamas, some quoting more generally their aspirations, or some quoting a Palestinian liberator from the 70s. Do you think from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, should be censored in any way? I think this starts with the naivety test. And I think there are some people who hear that slogan, that that folksy rhyming couplet, and they think, well, this is wonderful. It talks about freedom and liberation and so on. And I'm naive and callow, and I'm going to support that because those are worthy sentiments. But let's be very clear what this is about. This is about Palestinians asserting authority over the entire territory of Israel. And you look at the 1988 Hamas Charter, and they're very clear about that, that they assert that that needs to be achieved through ethnic cleansing and genocide. Now, what that means is that slogan effectively is a branch of that genocidal ethnic cleansing philosophy. There's no escaping that. There's no neutral position on that slogan. That's where it comes from. That's what gave birth to it. And if you're going to support that, if you're going to use that slogan, you have to bear in mind that you're advocating for genocide and ethnic cleansing. And that carries a huge burden. Should it be suppressed in the short term, you'd say, well, no, because this is a freedom. But then you have to think about what sort of person are you and what's your motive if you're advocating for this? And either you're, you're naive or you're actually supporting genocide. And those are the only two options you've got. Marcus and Josie, can you also hear the bays of disagreement uh, as as to the many people? And and I hear where you're coming from, Paul. But but is is that not a uh, just a dominating view in many ways to say that those are the only two reasons that people could could use that slogan? I know many many people. Oh, this is what, so sorry, Josie. Go ahead, yeah. Josie. Go ahead. I was going to say this is where I, I I agree with Paul. There's no way that that slogan cannot be interpreted as anything but a genocidal. Uh, commitment to eradicate Jewish people in the state of Israel, um, and and in the Hamas, uh, um, you know, manifesto, they promulgate the, the 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 what is it called? The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the most hideous anti-Semitic um, conspiracy that somehow all the bad things in the world that's ever happened have have been because of Jewish people. So I think. Um, it, the as you say, Paul, the naivety of the likes of Chloe Swabrook to stand up and chant, and then Green Party members to chant from the river to the sea, knowing they cannot but know what those words mean. That now I have no doubt that Chloe and Green Party MPs do not mean the the, the literal interpretation of that, but they should be cognizant of the fact as MPs, and this is where I'm not a free speech absolutist, that when they say that. Um, Jewish people hear that as a genocidal chant. So why on earth would you do that in this in your position as yes. MP? But you shouldn't yes, ban it. But you should ban it. Woman equals adult human female. So that's what I'm saying. It can be interpreted so you... as as a genocidal chant for the trans community. 
But again, for the same reasons that I argued the hideousness of saying um, um, awful Nazi slogans or a Nazi salute, you cannot also then ban, for the same reasons I would not ban, because the principle has to be applied in the toughest of cases where you have competing values, i.e. this is a hideous, offensive um, statement for Jewish people. But you have to be able to say, well, you know, stupid and naive and cruel of you mm. to say it, but I but I protect your right to say it. How do we take into account the the right for slogans or chants to evolve over time? Uh, the the majority of people my age that mm. I speak to about this and and who who stand on the pro Palestinian side, uh, and and uh, I I appear to be coming out on one side of this discussion tonight rather than the other. For those of you who perhaps are more interested in my personal perspective on this, I've 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 written about this a little bit. My master's thesis was on this a bit, so um my my perspective is probably not ambiguous. But but I'll play the devil's advocate here and say for those that are pro Palestinian, uh many people my age, sure you would say chant it ignorantly. But at what point does what the chant mean get to change? And can I answer that, I that to, very? <laughs> they, 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 they say Palestine will be free means that even the Israelis in their minds, they claim, live under an apartheid state. Now, personally, having grown up in Mozambique, I resent the use of the word apartheid outside of South Africa because there was a very particular context. But they want to use it there. And so they say that it is suppressing even the Israelis there. And that's once the, they would say Zionist argument is gone, Palestine and Israel will be free. Why can't the chant mean that? Because what your what your real question is there is can chants evolve, in, their meaning of a chant evolve over time? And of course they can, but not when you've got a live group like Hamas who are using it for, with a very clear call to action. Yeah. So uh, you don't get to and say... And just given oh, an example of what that means yeah. in action. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that I think that's the simple answer to that. Mm. Marcus, the, the Free Speech Union has said that burning flags should be protected. You referenced the Valerie Morse case, which, of course, uh, uh, for, for those who don't spend their time in the depths of legal tomes, uh, that was a, a, an 08 case, I think, when uh, Valerie Morse burnt the New Zealand flag mm. at an Anzac ceremony. Uh, in, in sight of, not quite, but yes. Okay. Yeah, she was, yeah. she was a and, bit further down the street. I'll defer to you on the technicalities, but I believe that the, 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 <laughs> you the, lawyer. Yeah, the, the court upheld her right to do it, despite the fact that there is a direct prohibition in New Zealand law against burning flags. Yeah, so so they said it wasn't offensive behaviour, um, effectively because you needed to show that you're provoking disorder by your actions. Um, and I think that the, the law in this area is a real mess um, because. I was looking into, I've been interested in the case of the the lawyer that you um, mentioned earlier, Jonathan, um, arrested at a, um, for demonstrating on the side of a pro-Palestinian match. Yeah, Lucy. Um, Lucy Rogers um, for obstruction. And I thought this can't be right. This is ridiculous. But actually, the New Zealand law in this area says that um, the police, um, where they are Fair, they have reasonable fear that you are an innocent protester and you will cause a reaction. They can they can ask you to to stop, and if you don't stop, they can arrest you for obstruction, um, which effectively is a thug's veto. So the problem in the Valerie Morse case is you're effectively setting up a a standard where the people at the ANZAC service weren't about to start a riot, and so therefore you can burn a flag. But in Lucy's case, the police said there's going to be a riot. They specifically said this, and therefore we can arrest you. So what you what's the incentive structure that we're setting up in our law? To be as violent and as radical in response to speech you don't like, and then the police will will stop that that speech or have a reasonable cause to stop that speech. Um, so I don't think you should be arrested. I don't think burning flags should be illegal. Um, I think the Supreme Court case was right, but I think the law in this area is a real mess. Mm -hmm. Paul or Josie, you, you'll know that the Free Speech Union has defended the right to burn these flags, that that isn't freedom of speech per se, but an important mm. element of free, freedom of expression. It can express incredibly visceral ideas, but those are the very ideas that are better out than in. Did we get it right on this on this count? No. Yeah. No, I think oh. you got it wrong. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Now, Good. now for those, you now go we've forward. got two minutes left. We've got a yes. host. Okay. Well, 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 even... Let's look. Look, the Star of David has been a symbol of Jewish people since probably even before the time of Solomon. At, at the end of the nineteenth century, that star was literally at the centre of the embryonic 
flag for the state of Israel. Um, and of course, as I said before, during the Holocaust, it was used to set aside a group of people for extermination, mass genocide, on a scale and in a format and in a scope that has never been seen before. If you're going to burn that flag and burn that symbol, there's a very close resonance between that and burning bodies, which is what happened in concentration camps. Can, can and I the just, connection for those... You, yeah. Can I hold you to some accuracy here? There, there can be. Because it can That's also said, yeah. just, well, I think you said there is, and is that there can? Well, there's a resonance. Yeah, well, no, but, there is a resonance. It's not a can issue. There but, absolutely but it's is also for, for the, many it's people. the flag of, of Israel. So then is Israel the only country whose flag we can't burn because of the historic oppression of its no, people? I see. Israel's the only country that's got a symbol on that flag that has gone back thousands of years. There's no other community on earth that has a consistently used symbol to identify itself. It's the only country from which its members have suffered a Holocaust. And that flag so it is, has been... It is exceptional in that regard. It's absolutely exceptional. And when you burn that, there is a resonance. It's not a maybe. There absolutely is a resonance for many Jews about the, I mean, the word Holocaust itself. Uh, the Greek derivation is a burnt offering. So that the level of insult from that flag is absolutely separate from every other flag. And on top of that, you come to the sophistication argument. How unsophisticated are you in terms of free speech when the best argument you've got is a box of matches and burning some fabric? Is that the best you can do? What, what are you trying to say? What's the point you're trying to make? I think that's anti-speech almost. Are, are we not richer for seeing the 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 lack of depth of their arguments though if that is all that again, they have to reach i don't i mean again i don't think this is about in any way respecting someone who burns a flag but i think paul if you take that to its logical conclusion there are so many flags of of you know post colonial uh, struggles where they would argue exactly the same that this flag you don't represents have to take it i mean to the mana motahaki uh, the, the you know the, the yeah. maori flag the the tinuranga tiratanga flag and so on so it, the the point here again is the principle that if you start if you start saying you can't ban that flag but you can ban that flag whereas you, aren't you better to say which is what the the supreme court case said was that burning a flag is symbolic speech you know it's a political statement it can be ugly it can be insulting it can be deeply offensive but it is not an act of violence against a person and it isn't going to incite an act of violence unless as you just mentioned Marcus there's a law that does but you know and, and Lord Sumption who was you brought out here recently Jonathan with the Free Speech Union you were very sort of British Lord um, I think he said something like flag burning is deeply discourteous you know which is a very British way of saying it's it's bloody awful and offensive and disgusting but I'll protect your right to do it and and you know, where do you draw the line? And burning a, a um, are you going to say it's okay? It, you, you can't, you can't make any statement that is insulting to something that symbolizes a people's history. Um, I mean, the the point that these things are insulting isn't the issue. The point is, you know, what if you ban them? Are you going to make it worse? Well, I'd say two things about that. Firstly, it goes beyond just insulting. I mean, this, this for some people, and admittedly a very small number of people, it revives memories of, of one of the worst things that's ever happened to us as a species. And so that that's something beyond the level of just insulting national pride or anything like that. The other thing, too, of course, is the issue of motive. Um, and I'd argue it's not even a speech issue. It's a, it's a demonstration of views issue in a very sort of clumsy way, but it's not a speech issue. There's no argument. When you put a match to a bit of fabric. You're not actually saying anything. You're not trying to convince anyone of anything. But You're just symbolic. saying, I hate this group. No, no I agree. It, well, it, as it's I said, horrible. It is, but it's sort of not. I, 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 and I think I said from the outset, it's not speech, it's expression. But what, I mean, uh, so so it, it seems there's a number of layers that we're going to impose over someone's ideas before they can express it, that it is sophisticated and that it's not ignorance and that it is speech and that there can be a response. It's not just a form of expression. Uh, aren't these the very tricks that are used by those who want to control the language on a host of other issues? I mean, it it, it doesn't seem to me, exact, and, and, and this is why I find it difficult to agree with much of what you identify, but what we do out of that it, it seems far more sensorial in my mind, in, in your perspective. And I, I sp fail to see what the safeguard against that is if we're not the ones deciding that it's the Jews who have had it for the symbol for 5,000 years. Well, how many years does it have to be? Does it have to be, well, does 3,000 years count it? Does 1,000 years count it? Is, is the Manamotuhake Tinorangatira flag sufficient where do we get do the cutoff can we burn the the gay pride flag that would be a 
deeply discourteous thing to do, wouldn't it, Josie? But should we have the right to do that? I mean, that would be visceral to many members of the rainbow community who feel that uh, certainly internationally and even domestically, they feel the rainbow community is subjugated. Who gets to decide? Well, it's not a binary issue. It's not a absolute right, no right whatsoever. Um, and, and I think international jurists would use the, the sui generis argument that there are certain circumstances, particularly in international relations, where there's a unique solution, where there's a circumstance that doesn't create a precedent for anything else, that applies only to that particular situation. And um, the other thing too, of course, is that if you do burn the, any sort of flag, again, it's not speech. It's, it's symbolic an expression speech. of something. Uh, well, well, what's symbolic speech? It's well, like the speech well that, I mean, I'm, I'm quoting, I'm quoting the Supreme Court, where I think it, and that yeah, was in that's the very case interesting, in what, but, 1989. But, but, but I think that's a, I mean, you know, that that's a really important way of looking at things that people do on a demonstration. They might make a huge, ugly paper mache head of Trump. That's a piece of, you know, symbolic political statement. You know, it's, it's, not it's speech, so actions. No, it's not speech. But, but, but the Supreme Court called it symbolic political speech. So you can do things and you can create objects or you can do things to objects that equate as symbolic political speech. If you start banning one, well, well then what well, ban the ugly Trump head of Trump? Well, it's just a pity that the Supreme Court didn't <laughs> identify their own paradox in having symbolic speech. I mean, it's they're two quite different things. Um, but but Paul, this... I don't think you would want to be arguing that freedom of expression generally doesn't matter, though. No, I haven't argued that, no. Uh, you're making a very sharp distinction between speech and expression as if the one is of significantly greater importance than the other. If we go back to the premise that free speech is a means to an end, which is establishing the truth about something. So there needs to be an exchange of ideas and some ideas will be more sophisticated than That's others. That's part and of whatever. what free speech is. Part I think it's the essential, the essential part. And historically, it's been the essential part I think it's stopping us kill each other. Yeah. Uh, no, no, there's other ways of stopping that. It's hard to um, pursue, it's hard to pursue truth if we're going around killing each other. Yeah, and that's why I, I never brought that into the equation. I'm, I, I think what I'm talking about is the fact that speech is a way of, of getting towards the truth. Things like burning flags or effigies of people, whatever, you can call them symbolic speech and you can sort of somehow gloss over the paradox of that phrase. But the fact is that it's not speech. It doesn't advance an argument. It doesn't help us get closer to the truth. What it is, it's an expression of someone's rage. It's quite a different kettle of fish altogether. Should we be allowed to burn the gay pride parade uh, excuse me the uh, gay pride flag no you shouldn't burn it no no no, that, a... no 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 i didn't ask whether you should burn it or not i said should you be allowed to burn it no and do you think there's there's a close connection between what you should be allowed to do and what you should do I'm saying, well, it's not about a close connection between what you should and shouldn't be allowed to do in the case of burning things, because burning anything is actually quite stupid. But I'm saying that in the context of a free speech argument, you can't bring in performative acts and say, well, this constitutes speech, because it doesn't. It's not speech. It's not making an argument. It's, and the question and test of it is this, does it bring you closer to the truth? No. We're strained over time here, and I appreciate the the um the audience who've stayed with us. This has been a fascinating discussion, and it's it's needed very little cudgeling from me. So I appreciate that. As we come to a conclu uh, closure, um, w one question that I did want to raise, and I think it, it, it stems out of these differences of opinions here, is are the terms Islamophobic and anti-Semitic being used to suppress debate. And, and, and Paul, I would put it to you, uh, again, arguing one side for your capacity to argue the other, that, that many people would say the term anti-Semitic is overburdened in order to suppress very legitimate opinions on many issues, such that you can't actually express anti-Zionist opinions, which are, it's a political perspective, because you'll be called an anti-Semitic because whether sui generis or not, we are overlaying this term of anti-Semitic because of a host of historical uh, phenomena. Do you think that either Islamophobic and or anti-Semitic are being used to uh, narrow debates in an unhelpful way? In the case of anti-Semitism, the answer is very clear. You look at the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of of anti-Semitism, and it absolutely permits the criticism of the state of Israel and so forth. Um, it's basically trying to prevent a form, a particular strain of racism. Um, the problem is, of course, that some people misconstrue it, but anti-Semitism is not about protecting 
anything else apart from that particular group in the way that we protect any other group from racism. Islamophobia definitely has been misused. Um, it's a criticism uh, or deals rather with contempt or hatred towards the faith and the adherence to that faith. And by using the term Islamophobia and by using the term anti-Semitism, you're presuming in-group un un uniformity, when in actual fact there's great diversity within both groups. So the, the terms themselves can become quite clumsy if they're not applied carefully. Marcus, where to from here? As, as we draw this conversation to a close, uh, what, what would be your parting comment to the friends you have in this room alone who clearly disagree, or those more generally, hopefully friends still as well, who, who disagree? Oh, well, I mean, I yeah, I mean, I've got friends who disagree about this. And, and one good thing is that we stop talking about it, which always helps. Um, but no, <laughs> I, I, um, I would say, look, it came at the start. I think that the problem is there's a lot of, um, there is a lot of uh, anger out there, but it's very, very shallowly, shallowly informed. Um, I think that, you know, getting to know a bit more about the, particularly the history of this, um, use it as, as a way to, to um, start reading a bit more, give it a bit more context, I think would be really, really great if we could get a bit more um, deeper conversation. But also, I'd just like to say, but on the on the substance of the debate tonight, I've actually been sitting in silence, um, agreeing with both um, sides, uh, both Paul and Josie, which um, shows that you can hold contradictory opinions in your, in your head at once. Um, but I, I just come down to, I just don't trust the government to make these sorts of dis distinctions. That's, that's where I come down i agree with a lot of the substance of what paul said but i just don't trust the government to make those sorts of um those calls and that's why i'm probably more um actually uh, towards josie's josie's side and the um in the legal sphere josie yeah, I, last I, words to you where do, where, where do we go from here well i i mean i think this has been a really good debate and and i think as you said, you know, you said with your wife, you know, I feel my mind changing. I and mean, I think that's the important thing is that these are really hard issues. And this particular debate over, um, or not debate, this particular crisis and tragedy with Israel and Palestine has, has just really shone a light for me on on the power the powerfulness of free speech and expression as the as an alternative to hurting each other further and i think that i hadn't quite grasped that until this issue and every generation i think has to have these same debates i mean we feel like groundhog day when you look back at your parents or your grandparents or whatever um, and i don't think we should worry about that i don't think we should feel that that's a defeat that we have to keep winning the argument for you know the values of universalism of, of enlightenment which are not western values and we're living in a time at the moment where these values of you know um free inquiry scientific inquiry free speech um human rights uh the, the rights of, of any individual no matter what your race your your sexuality your your, your ethnicity um and that that you know these things are, are being seen as west Western, and therefore people are fighting against them in a way that is completely erroneous and non-helpful to this debate and in, in this this issue with Israel and, and Palestine. So I think we have to realise that these values are not Western; they are for export. You know that the Muslim world has protected these values when the Christian world you know abandoned the Greek values of of uh, the original Greek values of sort of democratic values and, and liberalism. So I think it's really important that we find a way to to, to globalise justice and freedom in a way that we globalise production and, and, and trade, and we just don't give up. And I think these debates are part of that. Thank you all for everyone who's joined us tonight. Thank you especially uh, for my three friends here who, who have joined for a spirited conversation, one that I walk away richer for. Uh, it, 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 there is a risk. Um, I, 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 I get um, paid to sit around and opine about free speech, but there is a risk for the three of you uh, on, on coming out and talking about Israel and Palestine with the profiles you have. Undoubtedly, there will be people on either side who have disagreed with elements of what you've said. So I appreciate you standing up, being willing to contribute to this conversation. Josie, I think you hit the nail on the head there in terms of, of what we are all seeking for, the co-papa, if you will, of what we're coming towards, even if we come at it from different directions. So thank you for your time. Thank you to everyone who joined us this Friday evening for this conversation. Hopefully you had a, a glass of FSU Liberty Blush in your hand as you did. Uh, but for now, we'll leave it there and, and hopefully return not too long.